I'd like to welcome you to the opening event in our 2015 Klaus series on the arts and the culture of democracy. It's lovely to see new faces and the faces of those following the series from last year. We have four new events this year. Tonight's event on theater, then November 12th on fiction, January 21st, the visual arts, and April 21st will be music. In keeping with our usual format, we'll uh, keep the introductions very short. We always have fascinating speakers whom we could talk about at length, so we've given you full bios in the program, so you get a sense of the sterling qualifications of the conversationalists we have in front of you. And as is our happy want, our wonderful moderator, Ed Hirsch, will guide the conversation in which he'll be joined by Brian Dorries on his right, Rebecca McGore on his left, and Frank Garcia presenting the ideas of law and literature scholar J.B. White. I'll conclude with a final quote from White. Both the judicial opinion and the drama call upon us as readers to engage in our own versions of this fundamental activity of imagination and language. Become a maker of order yourself, they tell us. Become one who claims meaning for our shared experience or the possibility will be lost. Thank you. Hey everybody, I'm very glad to be with you for our conversation about theater in relationship to democracy. Um, my father was a salesman and ever since I read it when I was in high school, I was been very affected or moved by Death of a Salesman because I recognized him in it. It was, the, my, it was my childhood in a way. And a couple of years ago, I saw Philip Seymour Hoffman playing Willie Loman, and it was an absolutely shattering experience. It brought back so much to me. And one of the lines just has stayed with me from that performance for a few years. And there's a moment where Willie Loman says to his sons, I still feel kind of temporary about myself. And that sense of being temporary has haunted me for the last few years of being, I think he means fragmentary or unfinished or not resolved. It, it sort of rang a chord with me about my father and something about American life and something about American theater in particular. And it seems to me that there's a kind of anxiety about being American that has really driven much of our theater in the last, and performances in the last 15 or 20 years especially. Norman Mailer wrote an essay in which he said that there were two lives of a nation since World War II, of our nation in particular. And one life was a public life, concrete, factual, dull, except the consequences of the people who were so dull were tremendous for other people. And then there was the subterranean life of the nation, which was lonely and underground and sometimes violent. And thinking about my father and the subject of not feeling temporary about yourself. And then thinking about the underground life of the nation against the official life of the nation, I began to feel that American theater in particular and performances too, performance theater, operates in this gap between our official identity of what we think that Americans are supposed to be or what they might be or what this ideal of being an American is and the actual reality, the actual truth of what people's lives are actually like. And the conflict between this anxiety about what we're really like and this determination to make our lives seem like they're American lives against this ideal, this clash, is one of the continual spaces of American theater, and that this space seems to me crucial to thinking about our identity, that we need these frames to think through the consequences of the play formats of what the official version is and what the real version is, and how those things come in conflict. And that framing device, that framing nature, seems to me cru crucial to dramatizing 
thinking through and f deciding how we feel about being American. So. Uh, hello, my name is Brian Dorries. Uh, I'm the founder of a project called Theater of War. And for the last uh, five and a half years, I've been touring the country and the world presenting readings of ancient Greek tragedies, war plays by Sophocles for contemporary military audiences in military setting as a catalyst for eliciting open, powerful, truthful conversations about the visible and invisible wounds of war, about the impact of war on individuals, families, and communities. And um, the work is hard to describe in a very short period of time, but um, the performance in many ways is a pep rally on stage for a performance that happens afterwards in the audience. Um, and the model, although it doesn't exactly replicate the Athenian model, is definitely inspired by what happened in ancient Greece. So picture 17,000 citizen soldiers seated in an outdoor amphitheater in the center of Athens during a century in which the Athenians saw nearly 80 years of war. They're seated according to tribe, which was their military unit, and according to rank with the generals seated in thrones in the front, and the hoplite cadets who were uh, late adolescents were matriculating both into the army and into civic participation, sitting in the nosebleed section in the back. And they're watching plays that are written by a general named Sophocles, a man who we know was elected general twice in the Athenian army, and he certainly didn't get elected for writing nice plays, although Pericles made the suggestion that maybe he wasn't a great general, and maybe he was a public affairs general after all, in the end, and was communicating uh, to the masses. And uh, you're watching plays that explicitly, not all, but many, deal with topics that only those who've been to war or cared for those who've been to war could possibly begin to understand. And you have a flavor for the role that a Greek tragedy played in mediating a discussion within the most highly militarized democracy perhaps to ever have inhabited the earth. Um, and you get the city, looking at theater and the birth of tragedy concurrent with uh, uh, the birth and, and ascendance of Athenian democracy, one starts to see a lot of connections. And you know, the more time I've spent, we've done more than 316 performances now uh, for more than 60,000 service members, veterans, and their families all over the world. And we've approached it with the attitude that an audience that's lived lives of mythological proportion, who face the stakes of life and death, who've loved, who've lost, who know the meaning of sacrifice, knows more than we as civilians about these ancient plays. And like an external hard drive plugged back into the audience for whom it was originally intended, I see ancient Greek tragedy as um, an ancient military technology for doing something very specific. Jonathan Shea, in his book Achilles in Vietnam, talks about tragedy and also Homeric epic as uh, a tool for communalizing the experience of war. Not, hey, you veteran, you shoulder this burden on your shoulder, but the miasma, the pollution of what comes back to where we as a community are going to come together and face it. So often people ask me, well, where's the hope in all this work that you do? We now have 14 projects that all address pressing public health and social issues using tragedy as a catalyst for discussion about very dark and challenging subjects. And I would simply say that I think the hope um, is not in the plays. The plays are extremely hopeless in some ways. And, and for a millennia, um, they've been taught as if they're expressions of nihilism or sort of futility and with regard to our agency in a world in which we barely apprehend our own possibilities of agency. Um, I would say the hope is in the audience that comes together to bear witness to the truth of the play as a community, shoulder to shoulder, according to tribe and according to rank. And so um, one, from my perspective, looking at the audiences for whom we perform, starts to see a model emerge that seems intrinsically democratic. The theater was born from this need um, not just to hear and, and tell the veteran story, but to stage and to debate ethical topics. And you know, Plato's critique notwithstanding, um, framed with compassion, framed with emotional resonance um, that connects people rather than dividing them. So what I've learned as we've been touring mostly red state America, is if you want to have a conversation that divides us into democracy, Start with an extremely realistic portrayal of human suffering first, then have the conversation. And something else happens. We don't end up screaming at each other. Um, and 
I think that model um, has much to teach us. For me, uh, the greatest lesson has been um, that the audience always knows more. Always. Um, and I think the flow of culture in our country and American theater currently is usually pretty much one way. Um, we're going to declaim, we're pass this gift on, we're going to bestow it upon you, the audience that sits in the dark. But what if the audience is actually the entity, the, the, the body politic that imbues the performance with significance and meaning? And what if the plays don't mean anything, but really are designed to do something? Um, physical, biochemical, spiritual, political, to us as a group. So that's the work I've been doing, and that's probably five minutes. Um, but I look forward to talking more about it. Yeah. It reminds me of a poem by William Matthews called Poetry Reading at West Point. And at one point, the cadet says, Sir, why do your poems give me such a headache, sir? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, saying, I was saying to Ed that the, the beauty of the work that I do is that our audiences are, uh, what they say in the military, voluntold to attend. And unfortunately, in the academy, even in the academy, it's hard to voluntell anyone to, yeah. to show up. Yeah. But yeah. would that we could in the American yeah. theater. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. We'll be going to a Broadway play, <laughs> sir. <laughs> So, as Kim mentioned, uh, my role here is to help you think. Uh, my, my role here is to bring into the conversation some of the perspectives of James Boyd White. And if, it's an interesting task, particularly after hearing um, Ed and Brian, because in a very significant way, you've just seen embodied the ideas of James Boyd White with respect to speech, with respect to the fundamental relationship between democracy and theater. So what I can do in the time I have is maybe draw out some of those implications and make a few of those points about why it is that White, who is uh, fundamentally uh, both a legal scholar and a scholar of the humanities, uh, why he sees these essential connections, uh, why he writes so much about some of the plays that, that Brian's company uh, puts on. Uh, uh, like Ajax or, or Philoctetes. Um, so White's uh, abiding interest is in language. In particular, how is it that we bring meaning out of our experience through language? And he has a particular kind of language that he is very interested in, which he calls living speech. Uh, and we've seen two examples of this just now. Uh, for White, uh, living speech is a speech uh, which uh, either preserves, enhances, or protects uh, human meaning, uh, our capacity for making meaning, uh, human dignity, uh, respect, justice. Uh, and therefore, it's at the center of a wide range of disciplines and fields and endeavors that all involve language, which makes him an ideal person for a series like this in which we're exploring the relationships between many different forms of practice and this thing we call democracy and, and what it is that makes democracy work uh, and how can the arts feed that. And in fact, White was one of the real inspirations uh, in Kim's thinking about the series uh, way back in the beginning. So I want to say a few specific things about what it is that law and democracy and theater all have in common from the perspective of white. So first uh, is risk. For law and for theater and for politics to work, uh, we have to believe that something is at stake. And not only that, but we have to believe that the actors themselves recognize and believe that something's at stake. And by actors here, I mean judges, uh, lawyers, politicians as well as stage actors. If, if we fail to recognize that something is at stake in law or in politics or in theater, or, or, or the actors themselves do not act as if something is at stake, uh, then uh, it's not living speech. Instead, it's uh, a kind of speech that's going to provoke uh, indifference, cynicism, apathy. And as White points out, that, that's very dangerous. Uh, and it's dangerous because, in fact, something is at stake, even if people involved don't recognize it, or if uh, the body politic or the audience don't recognize it. 
And for White, it's really nothing short of our humanity itself. Uh, the question for him is, uh, will this particular act of speech in this moment, whether it's a legal moment or a political moment or a theatrical moment, will this act of speech in fact enhance or erode uh, humanity, our human nature, our human dignity, our possibilities as an individual and as a community? Now, White writes a lot about theater uh, because theater uh, excels in its capacity to identify what is at risk and to dramatize it. Uh, and that had, uh, you see that in his discussion of uh, the Ajax play, for example, uh, in which he takes the, 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 the incredible uh, moments that Ajax is in as an individual and talks about what it represents uh, for that society, uh, for the soldiers, uh, for the community that's facing increased militarization, uh, and those kinds of questions that come out of that particular moment, so risk. The second element they have in common is that they all presuppose mind. And let me take a minute to explain what he means by that. So White is very interested in how we use language to shape our own minds and to know our own minds, and then to express our minds to other minds. And uh, as a scholar, I, he's, it's very interesting how he com compares what he considers to be good law, uh, good theater, and working democracy uh, as all having this quality in which that we can recognize in them the presence and activity of human mind. Uh, it's something like voice. If you hear a character's voice either on the stage or on the page or in a poem, and you say the voice is not working, or the voice is working. And if the voice is working, it has a kind of authority. And if the voice is not working, then it doesn't have authority. And if we think about examples of what you might call the pathologies of law or the pathologies of democracy or theater, uh, they also have in common uh, that they lack mind, an absence of mind or discernible mind. For example, um, one of uh, White's collaborators, Joe Vining, uh, my teacher at Michigan, uh, talked about bureaucratic law as a kind of pathology of law, or mindless law, he would call it, where we all talk about machine politics. And we've all seen characters, either characters on the stage or characters in the political uh, theater, uh, that don't hold together. Uh, and, yeah. <laughs> Enough said about that for the moment. <laughs> Uh, and um, the voice isn't right. So, so whatever we think about what they're saying, they don't have authority. Uh, and the third point, uh, and maybe the most important uh, for what we're doing tonight, is that uh, law, democracy, uh, and theater uh, all have to be performed. It's essential to these particular cultural practices that they be enacted, or they cannot achieve their transformative potential. Whether it's uh, a judicial decision, a legislative act, uh, an act uh, on the stage, uh, it's essential uh, that, uh, that we see in, in these cultural practices uh, meaning being made publicly and communally. And I think that's at the heart of why White believes that this, this is, these are so important and why they have an important conversation, is that they have this capacity to establish and uh, uphold these kinds of core human values in a very public uh, and a very performative way. So I'd like to, to talk a little bit about the intersection of uh, democracy and theater to start with, um, not in America, but actually in Egypt. So in the, in the fall of 2011, I actually started working on translating uh, plays that were coming out of the Egyptian uprising uh, the Radcliffe Institute actually commissioned the first translation for their conference, Women Making Democracy. They wanted a theatrical performance to open the conference. And I ended up co-translating and directing a reading of Ibrahim al-Husseini's Comedy of Sorrows. And this is a play about a diverse group of men and women, rich and poor, city dwellers and peasants, who band together in an unnamed square to overthrow an unspecified regime. Uh, it's a play that celebrates mass mobilization, but warns people to take heed of the forces waiting to hijack their popular uprising. 
Working on the translation of this text inspired me to seek out more Egyptian plays to translate. Uh, in fact, I have to say that the themes that were being explored in these plays were things that were themes that in, in some ways I felt were absent from the American theater. So it was a, it was a big inspiration. And I ended up co-editing an anthology of Egyptian plays and translation. And in working on this project, I wanted to know when was it exactly that Egyptian theater artists started writing about the, the uprising? Uh, how soon after the uprising started did this become a topic for them? And in visiting my colleagues in Egypt, what I discovered was that they were making theater inside the protests. They were there from the beginning. And uh, the occupation of Tahrir Square unleashed this surge of creative energy, and the theater artists made their voices heard by composing and chanting slogans, by shouting speeches, by you know, regaling the crowds with impromptu sketches and satires. And here I'm going to, actually, I can't look at the, oh, here it is. OK. So this is a, uh, this is a <laughs> picture that one of my friends took on his cell phone, hence the low resolution. But this is the revolutionary artist stage in Tahrir Square. And it was one of several platforms that were erected for performances. Um, theater was instrumental in this quintessentially democratic moment. And theater was a way of mobilizing people, of having a conversation, of crystallizing goals. And it was also, very importantly, a way for grassroots activists to counter the official narratives propagated by the government-controlled media. And this, I think, also speaks a bit to what, uh, to what Ed was saying about an alternative narrative, an alternative space. Theater artists in Egypt took to the streets. Um, and there were many different kinds of performances that were going on in the square. One of the theater artists, uh, Said Soleiman, he actually was creating uh, a series of, of projection sequences for his new play, The Window, which he was filming inside the demonstrations. And the, the play was called The Window, and it actually premiered in May of, of 2011. And it's about this government, this very anxious government clerk named Hamid. That's Hamid there. And uh, Hamid is afraid of everything. He's afraid of his boss. He's afraid of the neighborhood cleric. He's afraid of all forms of authority. And then one day, on his way home from work, he stumbles upon the protests in the square. And he sees his daughter on top of the shoulders of these protesters. And he is inspired to join the protests. And he is emboldened to utter aloud, a, this is his daughter Sarah. And again, they're filming this with the actors inside the square. And he's emboldened to utter uh, aloud a lifetime of grievances. Um, this, is, this is kind of a before and after shot. So this is Hamid after. It was very different than the first shot you saw. And this is uh, actor Hamad Ashusha, a wonderful Egyptian actor who's uh, acting and demonstrating inside the demonstrations. <laughs> Here we go. Um, and uh, Suleiman's production stressed the dialectical relationship between the individual citizen and the collective. And it explored how the experience of mass protest inspires and empowers the individual to overcome his fear. And the individual, in turn, contributes his newly gained strength to the collective protests. Uh, another um, group that was performing in the square was uh, Al Kusha Puppets. This was from March of 2012. And they created these giant puppets. This is their first, one of their first very famous appearances. They created giant puppets of uh, military leaders from SCAF, the Supreme Council of Armed Forces, who was actually the interim government after Mubarak was, was deposed. And the protesters were really encouraged to laugh at these very powerful figures. Um, and these puppets were kind of like uh, giant men children jabbing. Uh, they, they, you can see their giant hands at the crowd. Uh, so as you can see, just from you know, only two examples of, of performance in, in Tahrir Square, there was a lot of theater going on inside the demonstrations. So the interesting thing was that once I started researching uh, recent Egyptian protest theater, I discovered that, of course, <laughs> for these theater artists, 
momentum for the revolution began years before the uprising of 2011, and that the theater of protest and revolution that appeared in recent years was, wasn't a new departure. Uh, it represents really just one episode in a very long tradition of politically engaged theater in Egypt. So for decades, theater artists had been portraying the effects of the Mubarak regime on ordinary Egyptians. And in developing these works, they were drawing, of course, on a longer tradition, an even longer tradition of anti-colonial and anti-elitist theater going back to the early 20th century. Um, and of course, you know, the question is always, I think, how far back do you want to go? Um, <laughs> one could easily argue that this politically engaged anti-elitist theater started even before the colonial period. Uh, Egyptian theater scholar and critic Nihad Saleha I wrote a brilliant article uh, on the history of censorship on the Egyptian stage, and she's looking at politically engaged theater from the Mamluk Sultanate in the med medieval period. Um, so to, to kind of reconnect back to some of the things that the other speakers have said, I think we often trace uh, politically engaged theater back to Greece uh, and to a Western tradition, but Egyptians, uh, who we might consider part of the Orient or the East, also lay claim to this legacy. Um, but again, what, what does Egyptian theater have to do with the way we as Americans understand democracy? Um, I really, I love what, uh, what Brian is saying about the, the relevance of classical literature in our lives today. We, we speak of theater in the Greek polis and how these older traditions can greatly enrich our conversation about democracy today. And similarly, I would argue that contemporary Egyptian drama and actually Arab drama in general um, holds great relevance for American audiences. So our challenge in looking at uh, Arab drama is how to bring these plays to an American audience in a way that provokes self-reflection. So we don't want to limit our thinking about these plays as texts that can only teach us about another culture or a foreign or exotic culture. In reading and producing these plays, and I, you know, I was looking actually at examples of performances that were in the square, but these same theater artists you know, would go back to the theaters and create more formal dramas on, on written texts. Um, so in reading and producing the written texts that were coming out of Egypt, uh, we want to ask, how are they relevant to American audiences today? So just an ex as an example, we wouldn't stage a classical Greek play as a way to learn, as only a way to learn about ancient Greek culture. We're staging these Greek, you're staging these plays as a way to connect with the experience of your American audience today. Um, so my, you know, for me as a theater artist, my big question is how can I translate and stage these protest plays from Egypt for my American audience? Um, and I just, it's a, it is a big challenge, and it's, it's one that I've been taking, taking on in the last few years. And I'd just like to really end with a few images of a recent production that I directed of three short Egyptian plays um, with some students, actually, in, in February in New Jersey. Um, this is an image of a play called Report on Revolutionary Circumstances by Magdal Hamzawi, and uh, this is a play about a shoeshine kid who lives on the streets in Cairo and who joins up with a group of revolutionary artists. And again, this is a, a production in New Jersey, a recent production in New Jersey. Um, and this is a... These are performers in, the, in a recent American production of uh, The Mirror. And this is a monodrama about a young girl from a religious uh, lower middle class family who believes that her only chance for a decent future is to find a husband from a good family. Um, again, just thinking about how do we not only translate the text, but how do we translate the staging of these plays and make it relevant uh, for our American audiences? Because I would say that we actually have a great deal to learn from Arab theater artists, from non-Western dramatists, uh, and they give us profound ways to, uh, and distance to, uh, for self-reflection. I'm very stimulated. I'm overstimulated <laughs> <laughs> by what everyone's been saying. Um, one of the things that really struck me is that I have a theory that the, the meaning, because I'm a poet and a, and a critic of poetry, I have a theory of poetry that the meaning of poetry is not in itself, that 
the meaning of poetry actually exists in the relationship that's established between the poet, the poem, and the reader. And the poetry is actually, the reader brings meaning to the poem. And one of the things I was hearing about from what you were saying is that we often teach plays and think about plays as if the meaning of the play is intrinsic in the play itself. That's how I learned it. Um, but in fact, what you're saying in a way is that because the difference between a poem and a play is that a play is something you experience in a performance collectively rather than individually. When you're reading a poem, you hear it, you read it to yourself. But when you're seeing a play or participating in a play, you're in a group. It's a group response. But what I was really hearing you were saying is that the meaning of the play actually is not intrinsic in the play itself. It's in the relationship that's established between the particular audience that's there and because you're dealing with very particular audiences and then translating it in the in a way the drama is partially the interaction between what's in the play itself how it's mediated or performed by various actors what's at stake for the actors not just the playwright and then how the audience responds and the audience, and this is what you two are saying, I think, in some ways, the audience is giving meaning by bringing their own experiences to those plays. And one of the things you were saying is the audience knows more about those plays than the performances because of their own experience. Yeah, and it's a radical position for those in the culture business to take. Yeah. We're yeah. sort of, we may get thrown off yeah. out of university for Right, right, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Take it somewhere yeah. else, yeah. hippies. <laughs> Uh, Guerrilla theater artist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Peter Brook, uh, the great stage director, recently said that um, in the 60s um, it was about space and now it's about audience. And I think that's, you know, that speaks to what everyone has said to a certain extent. And, and, and you know, um, uh, there is a difference obviously between a play and a poem, but, um, you know, I, I, I at least don't see plays, whether they're texts, or uh, videos or images of, of performances, anything really more than a blueprint for felt experience. Um, and I mean, I, one can make the argument of poetry as well. To Absolutely. Um, but I give myself a pass as a translator of read plays, as a director of read plays, uh, to, to think of the play as a felt experience um, that's being received by a very specific audience. And when I started thinking about audience in that way, um, it, it changed. It changed my entire approach to, to theater itself. But I think it's a radically different proposition. You you hear writers, you hear artists talking about working for themselves, um, and I think in the culture business, um, you know, the most the most banal of all responses we hear from audiences is when you bring the artists out, and and the audience then asks us questions about how we created our work. Um, you'd think that after. Uh, the myriad of experiences we've all had in this room of going to see a play and being moved and then having a, the soul deadening experience afterwards of talking to artists about their work, we would innovate upon that. Oh, it was so hard. <laughs> um, that there's actually an opportunity in every performance to move the needle with regard to the felt experience that we've all had and we'll get time after time after time yeah. in the Western theater. Right. We squander it. And the kind of theater you had up on the screen, you know, obviously is, is, is different. Um, it's a different ballgame. I was going to say text and action, but they're not even text some of the time, right? Well, I was showing you pictures of the performances that were happening, the protests, yeah. but the in the anthology, actually, there there are texts. They're actually plays. So, but but I but they don't. Some of the same theater artists are are doing both. And in fact, what's very interesting is how they're they were inspired by the kind of theater that they were creating in the streets and how they took that back into the theater and then that relationship was going back and forth. I mean, I think we should say that one of the major innovations in American theater in the last 25 years is to try and break down the fourth wall right. between the performers and the audience. A lot of performance art doesn't have text exactly or has emergent text and tries to break down to make the audience more participatory create this other dramatic experience in the audience for the audience, really. Yeah. I, think, I think you're also getting at part of what makes it seem to me uh, virtually miraculous that we can talk about staging plays uh, that come out of one time and place. 
in such a radically different time and place and have this expectation that it's going to speak to something of a shared experience or create a shared experience. Uh, I was very struck by, I was doing some research uh, about um, Sophocles' plays, and you may know this from your own back, uh, the work you've done, but uh, it, last year uh, Antigone was uh, staged in Beirut uh, with uh, a company made up of Syrian refugee women. And to me, there's something miraculous about what makes that even possible. Uh, and, and I think it gets at this question of why, why, why it may be that exercises like this are feeding what we think of as the culture that makes democracy possible. Because to have that shared experience has to create a, uh, the possibility that we can transfer that into the political sphere and, and have shared experiences of a similar kind there. I mean, it seems like two things at work in what you described it connect things that other people have said. One is um, distance, as you mentioned before. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I find that an audience, uh, I'm a little averse to documentary theater uh, as a form. I mean, I just don't enjoy it. Um, but I think audiences, uh, when they're being portrayed in a kind of photorealistic manner or occasionally manner, often find themselves on different defense. Maybe yeah, that, know what, yeah, that's what I mean. Explain like, what you saw the Laramie Project, the most most famous, most widely you know lauded um, example in the last 25 years of documentary theater, where um, Moses Kaufman and his theater company go into Laramie, Wyoming, after the death of Matthew Shepard, um, a, a gay man who was killed on account of his uh, sexual preference, and he um, they interview all the people in the town, they create this sort of narrative, this story, and then they tour it, and it becomes the most popular um, sort of community theater event of the last 25 years in some ways. It's great, it, it moves the needle socially. Um, my point is simply that um, distance is a great tool. Um, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're portraying to an audience a mirror of themselves in a really direct mm -hmm. way, it, it puts us on the defensive. One of the great advantages of using Greek tragedy or staging an, an Arab play for Western audiences, we're not saying this is you. We're just simply asking you to reflect what do you see of yourself in this. And if you want to stand behind the archetypes, the characters, and talk about them, you can't. If you want to step out from behind it all and say, that is my story, that's your choice. Um, but there's something about distance that creates. Um, it's a pro it's a, I, would, I call it a provocative distance. Where, where you are, it's certainly as a, you know, you're a director as well, where I am very conscious of making those connections with my American audience. I'm very conscious of who I'm casting and what roles and what that means or how, whether consciously or unconsciously, my audience will read you know, an African-American actress in this role or uh, you know, a certain composition that they see on the stage. How does that uh, suddenly provoke them to think about this play as something that belongs to them? A play is a kind of fiction. And we, I mean, what you're talking about is the documentary tries to break down, in a way, the fictive distance. But there's something to be said for that fictive distance in sort of transformation. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like, I think it can be, for those who've experienced the thing that's being described on stage, I mean, how many times I now know that I've been sensitized to the military, what, how coded it is, and how subtle to see actors marching in line, even if they've had someone come and train them to do it. It's, it's offensive. You know, the, the, you know, we don't, we wouldn't do that with, we would, you know, I'm sure if Catholics from this university saw actors portraying Catholics, it would be, there'd be things about it that you'd have to, to extend a sort of imaginary puissance, give it a little bit of um, leeway, um, but with with distance, um, you know, we can challenge the audience to make the connection themselves. The other thing I was going to say briefly is just simply that I think what's great about Syrian refugees portraying the, the reverse of this, portraying Antigone, is that this is an audience that intrinsically understands. The stakes couldn't be clearer for them. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that happens with the plays that we do for um, contemporary military audiences, other audiences who experience trauma, is they come up afterwards and say, that didn't sound like high poetry to me. That sounded like <laughs> something I said to my wife in front of our kitchen table. So in fact, it is kitchen sink realism mm -hmm. when you've lived the experience that's being described by the play, the extremity of those experiences. So. It is striking that we seem to need this extrapolation, this extra space, to step back from traumatic experiences and powerful political experiences to frame them in a certain way so that we can think about them. I mean, um, when you're reading the Iliad, you are not in a war. You are reading about the war. And even when Homer was, when the bards were singing that poem, 
they were singing the poem and framing the war. When you go to a um, Palestinian wedding and poets are dueling with each other, it's a kind of ritual violence, but it's not actual violence. We seem to need this frame around war in particular, but around all kinds of traumatic experience to help us think about them. And in a way, the word catharsis is related here, right, in terms of traumatic experience. Yeah, it's such a big word. I, you know, I just think it was about empathy and catharsis. Now I think it's about shared discomfort. Um, <laughs> one of the notes I give our actors, uh, one of the actors I work with a lot is Paul Giamatti, and he revels in making himself uncomfortable and making the audience uncomfortable. After the best performances we've done, he said, um, that I'm, I'm really humiliated by what I just did. And I'm not sure that's a healthy thing for an actor to seek, but he seems to seek it. And I whisper in his ear before he goes on every time, make them wish they'd never come. <laughs> We often feel that when we go back to the hotel at night. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, are you starting to yeah. process this? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. But I, but I think, um, to your point, Ed, I don't know, I meant to go one step further. If I felt all the things that it would be appropriate to feel on my walk to work when I passed the homeless veteran and the drug addict and the woman hitting her child on the subway, and I let myself feel those things, I would be so overwhelmed. If I, 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 would, I need the mediation of a of a narrative, of a story, to, in an appropriate context, to begin to have those feelings in a way that's, that, that's appropriate. Maybe that's what the crisis is about. It's a, such an enigmatic word. Well, you might say that cultures implode when they don't have it. And that, I mean, if you think about what's taken away in authoritarian societies, where it's taken away, people go to tremendous lengths in authoritarian societies to try and create the space for this. And when you take it away, something profound is lost in the or they, when you take it away, they go to the streets. Right, yeah, right. And excited. Right, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I'd like to, to speak to this point that you're bringing up about how we need narrative and how, um, and, and Brian is talking about all these different things that we experience in, in our lives. And one of the things that certainly the Egyptian art, the theater artists um, were very clear about is that people need theater to crystallize the feelings and the, the kind of more amorphous things that were going on in their lives and to, to crystallize that into a narrative and to bring that into a collective narrative um, and to bring that into a narrative that actually is shared within the, within the nation, within, within the country. Um, and it's interesting that, you, you know, you were also, you opened by talking about the space in the American theater being about um, these different and fractured forms of identity. And one, one difference I would say about where the focus is oftentimes in Egyptian theater is there is a lot of attempts at forming collective narrative. Where are we, what are we trying to do together? And, I, and, and, and interestingly, I, I think that sometimes that, that in our own new playwriting in this country, we were doing wonderful work um, about different identities, different groups that we um, in our in our country, but we are we're not asking th what those we kind can of do together. what we can do together yeah, exactly. Yeah, and 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 uh, and of course what when my people can do death of a salesman, do, yeah. death of a salesman. You know, yeah. Arthur Miller was aiming to write a, a, a national narrative, an American tragedy, uh, and you know one one might ask, well, where what would those plays look like today? we should open it up to the audience, but before we do, I, I just want to mention a sociologist to you named Irving Goffman in a book he wrote called Frame Analysis. And the reason I want to do it is because Goffman, as a sociologist of everyday life, argues that we're continually creating the spaces in our ordinary life that actually create dramas. That we're continually framing different kinds of experiences socially. That our own social life is not just, in, in order to to have experience, to understand it at all. It's just not one unmediated thing. We're continually separating off and creating interactions between, which have beginnings, middles, and ends in our interactions with different people. And that we're using the frames of drama all the time as we go through our daily life to think about, to think about daily life itself, to segment the day and to play different roles so that we can't function as a single identity in a whole day. 
so that sometimes you're a father and sometimes you're a son and sometimes you're a student and sometimes you're a teacher and sometimes you're a citizen and sometimes you're, you have a job and sometimes you're a citizen meeting a policeman and anyway there are all kinds of roles that you have unthinkingly in every day to get through the day to divide it and that we're all participants in a kind of daily drama that is on a scale it's not the same thing as theater but it's on a scale with theater it moves in the theater into performance and sometimes we're not aware of those performances and many times we are many times we may, we know we're playing a role and we know that there's a social role that we're playing and it has rules and that we've internalized those rules and that, that that's a scale moving towards theater from our ordinary experiences in daily life. So, questions, thoughts, complaints. Well, those you should save for Kim later. <laughs> Any questions for us? Yeah, as I was listening to these very uh, um, uh, interesting presentations, I, I was reminded of, since you mentioned theater and classical theater, uh, and we're supposed to be talking about democracy. Um, I was reminded of that section of Nietzsche's Birth of Tragedy, where he's going to tell us about what tragedy actually is. And so he polishes off this group of people who are saying that tragedy and the chorus uh, in Greek tragedy is basically uh, the emergence of democracy. And then he goes on to develop his own theory. And it reminds me, I mean, how is it that drama I mean, it seems to me the analogy is that, that drama or uh, performance creates a people. Mm. You know, it's very, I mean, you know, all this stuff about modern democracy in association with, with the creation of a people. And uh, I'm sure particularly with the, the Egyptian uh, uh, protest phenomenon, that that's really what's going on. You're creating a public identity vis-a-vis vis-a-vis -vis performance. And I just wonder what you folks think about that. Mm -hmm. That seems very stimulating. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it seems interesting, your idea about relating tragedy to the movement of, a, I mean, Nietzsche argues that when it, it moves from a single voice to a choral voice, which is in a way the movement from poetry to drama, yeah is the choral audience creates a, creates a group, and that group creates a filter for the audience, and that creates a kind of democratic space. Yeah, I mean, there's no question the, audit, the chorus, you know, whether we agree with each other or not, functions as a mediator between the audience, the world of play and the world of yeah. audience. And that really, that's, that what defi that's what defines ancient theater, uh, this, this chorus that's the of those worlds. Um, I was reminded of this to you of this article by this woman, Catherine Hunter, who's a biographer. She wrote in 81 an article um, called A uh, Greek Chorus for William McPhee. And, and it was, it's, a, it's, a, it's a piece about end of life. One of the projects we do is about end of life here. We do performances in hospice and palliative care of an ancient Greek play called The Women of Trachis, which at its end has a scene in which Heracles, having been accidentally poisoned by his wife, Nera, suffers on stage for 20, 25 minutes, this unending agony that only the greatest of all human beings could suffer, the farthest limits suffering and it's performed on stage and he begs his son in the Greek to euthanize him, to be my doctor, to burn me alive in the Greek, be my eater. And um, she makes this argument, not about specifically about that play, that what's lacking from this course about end of life care, this is in 81, that he is the chorus, that when you go into the hospital and you um, are diagnosed with terminal illness and you're passed off to the social worker and the doctors relinquish uh, their part in all of it, and you're beyond the limits of medicine. Uh, there's no one there, whether you're incapacitated or not, to agonize over that decision collectively as a group, and then collectively shoulder the burden or the pollution of that decision. Um, it comes down to people in isolation, families in isolation, doctors in isolation. So this model of the chorus, in her argument, and it speaks to the way we use the play, the communal analysis. There is no right or wrong answer in the context of the play. Greek tragedy, as I would define it, is a, a story in which everyone is right and someone's going to die. Uh, there's going to be a sacrificial act, uh, and we can see it from all sides. 
um, so as to draw us into a relationship where we can collectively agonize over those ethical um, decisions as a democracy. I think, I think, David, also you're putting your finger on a question that's implicit in what we're talking about, which is uh, if, if, if drama makes a people, what kind of drama does a pluralist liberal democracy need to make a pluralist liberal uh, demos? Uh, and I think that's a very challenging question, and I think it's one that we could explore through, the, through this whole series. And part of the answer seems to me from what you were saying, Rebecca and you, Brian, that that it that 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 this kind of pluralist liberal society needs every kind of theater, uh, because it's essential that people learn how to cr how to cross these gulfs and engage in those acts of empathy, which we hope will will make will, will make the demos work. Uh, but it also seems to me it can't just be discrete, isolated instances of different traditions of theater, but there needs to be people that 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 make it their business to help those acts of translation, like, like, you're, like you're both doing. Uh, one, of the, one of the interesting things to see of how, again, the participation of the theater artists in Egypt in the protests and creating theater in the protests then influenced their creation of the written text was to see what they did with, um, you could say, the chorus. So they, in, there were you know, some, several quite a, a number of uh, plays that, in which the chorus or the ensemble or the collective were the hero. So there was not a, a tragic figure, there was not a protagonist, but that it, they were true ensemble pieces and that that uh, form is, is in some ways very radical. And I, I think you know, it should be said that they are very informed of both Western and Eastern traditions and in some ways are much more broadly educated theatrically than, than we are because they, they have a, a truly, um, they truly more, have more access or more educated in uh, world theater. The world not just being you know, the US and Western Europe or perhaps a little bit of Eastern Europe and maybe a, a Chinese play when someone wins a Nobel Prize, <laughs> but, but you know, truly, um, uh, different theatrical traditions that are informing the, um, these kind of works and um, drawing on a Greek tradition of a chorus and saying what happens if this is the hero. That's a fascinating kind of thought experiment, sorry, that think about we, we tend to associate, we tend to expect it's important to put sort of individualistic Western drama in front of more collective societies or traditional societies, but it seems you're turning the table and saying it's equally important to put that kind of theater that focuses on a collective narrative or a collective hero, in a sense, or collective identity in front of audiences that are used to a very individualistic experience. Yeah. I think that's going to come, something that might come up again in November uh, in, the, in the authoritarianism panel because of the people on that. For, for good. Um, and so what I'm wondering is if what, what happens if the audience doesn't want to critically reflect? What if the audience is just wanting the play to soothe its own concerns and to reinforce its own sense of, of, of righteousness? Um, what can the, the performers do to get the audience to critically reflect on precisely those issues it doesn't want to be empathetic or self-critical about? That, that is a really smart question because you've just you've you just asked the question of Broadway, basically. You've basic you've or you've just ra raised the question of why the large audiences who just want to go to musicals um, really don't want to go to want to, don't want to go to serious plays. Hey, hey, hey well, let's let's not down musicals. We do them extraordinarily well in this country, <laughs> and you know. Okay, point taken. Okay. Point taken. <laughs> but you There's can't get a serious play. In New York, it's extremely hard to get a serious play on in Broadway because tourist audiences want light musicals. I'm not saying they're not good, but I'm just saying that serious drama is in a bit of a crisis. Well, I'd like to just, be, I just, here's one thing too, is that serious drama, I mean, it sounds like spinach and uh, it's certainly another thing. I guess my, my theme of this evening is what can we learn from the non-Western theater practitioners? Um, certainly one thing is that we shouldn't separate between high and low. 
And we shouldn't have to separate between entertainment and serious drama. Because, um, you know, first of all, I, 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 I think it's not an overgeneralization to say that most of the audience members who go see quote unquote serious drama are, are part of quite a quite an elite audience. And um, the, right now it is really divided between those who go to see entertainment and those who go to see serious drama. And I think what we need to work on as theater artists is how do we try to create the art that's going to bring in a mixed audience? How do we create that democratic space within the theater? Um, which I think, in a way, we, we have abandoned, or it, is, it has uh, ceased to be one of our um, central goals. And so that, that is a question that I think, um, how can this, how can we be provoking, to answer your question, how, how can we be, be opening a conversation? How can we be provoking the audience without them even recognizing it at first, right? Without them noticing that we're getting them to think about certain things um, and, uh, and, and see how far we can take it. Yeah, and I think you know, our work takes place in homeless shelters, hospitals, field houses, um, the patient clinics, uh, you know, public squares. Um, mega churches for uh, 2,200 fundamentalist Christians, the project of the Book of Job after a tornado struck Joplin, Missouri. Um, you know, I think it's about taking it outside the theater. I find when we do performances in theaters, people are socialized to behave a certain way, and it frames their experience in a way we have to work against. Um, although, you know, it's great to bring it into the theater. Yeah, but I think too is that I, the work you're doing is extraordinary we, and we need more and more of it. But I think for me as well as who, someone who I work in a traditional theater um, and I, want, I would like to ask why aren't the people who you're bringing theater to coming into my theater? I want to bring them in too. I want to have these people sitting together in the theater because that's a charged audience. That's an audience that gives different meanings, I mean, it, it, in a different way. Um, I remember, you know, when I was an undergraduate uh, at Columbia, we took a production of Romeo and Juliet to a maximum security women's prison, and it, 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 was, it was a captive audience. It was, it was the most <laughs> incredible audience that I, I have ever performed for. I was actually, I was playing Juliet with uh, Brandon Victor Dixon as Romeo, who's a very, um, a very successful Broadway actor now, and he, and you know they were into the story. They were, um, they were waiting to see what was going to happen next. I mean, it was the kind of audience that you wish you had in this very um, socialized, as you're saying, um, theater audience that's going there to get their culture, yeah, right? right? Yeah. But, exactly. but in Super. some ways, I would I would ask too. You know, does this does our socialized, comfortable um, American theater audience, paying American theater audience, actually re want a mixed audience in their theaters? It has to be done. It's a Trojan. We have to the, roll the Trojan horse into the theater. <laughs> because I would say that if you go to a Stoppard play at Lincoln Center, you're going to be, you're going be, and you're paying to be made to feel more intelligent than you actually are. That, that, that's the reason people go to what you call serious plays for the most part. And, and that's, that's taking it one more level of cynicism um, than, than musicals. I mean, musicals can be incredibly dynamic um, uh, and thought-provoking. So, I mean, to your question, I think I mean, you're so right. I, I, I mean, I think there's a larger, actually, danger of anything that can sweep you up and, and affect your emotions. And, it, and anything can be used uh, as a tool, uh, you know, for, for, and you'll be talking about authoritarianism in, in the future. But I think um, the, the, the primary issue years ago, that was the NDA study um, of any kind. Um, and I, I think the central argument that we're all making is that theater as it a medium. It has to step, it has to move. It has to move, but it theater has to as move. a medium can do something that no other medium can. It has to do with suffering, it has to do with being together as a group, it has to do with, um, it has to do with having a collective response to felt experience of something in a room. Um, and we've lost touch with that as a culture, and I think it's dangerous um, for, our, for our culture to not have those spaces. I guess the other thing to say about theater is that it's, we're talking about face-to-face -face interaction in terms of it's something that's live, it's something that's performed in front of you. It's not screened. It's, it's in person, bodies in, 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 in relationship. 
I would just add to your question, which has obviously provoked a great deal of interesting thoughts already. Uh, maybe from White's point of view, is if you want to answer the conundrum that you're presenting, uh, find out what's really at stake for the majority of people. And as playwrights or as, as scholars, don't don't um, disregard or, or, or disdain what people find at stake in regular lives and try to write to that. And, and then you'll find that people are going to want to come. And I do think, going back to Miller's uh, Death of a Salesman, that that is a great example uh, of a Greek tragedy where uh, the Sophoclean of gods have been replaced with capitalism. And there's a tragic figure who is unable to apprehend the force of capitalism sacrifice in front of us and elicits a sense of helplessness in us as an mm. audience watching it, not so we'll go home and kill ourselves like he wants to or does, but so that we can awaken to our own agency within the system in which we're living and think about our values and how we relate to capitalism. And so death of a salesman isn't meant to uh, make us go home and cry into our fears. It's meant to wake us up to the possibility that we could be aware of our relationships with these forces before it's too late. And I think it did do that um, for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. It didn't just rip off wounds and uh, remind people of their father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it is striking what you were saying about tragedy before, is that one of the things that's striking to me, it's, I've always felt this about desolate poetry, why desolate poetry doesn't make me feel desolate but comforts me, why plays that some can seem hopeless in terms of their intrinsic meaning don't leave people feeling hopeless. They, in fact, leave you feeling that something's been articulated. And that recognition that something's been articulated as it is, as you feel it, as you understand it, actually gives you some comfort rather than some feeling of desolation. A great poem that's lonely doesn't make you feel more lonely. It makes you feel companioned. Yeah. And I think that's what I'd say about what you're discovering about certain Plays that seem hopeless actually are inspiring hope. The most common response we hear from military audiences to Sophocles Ajax, a story about a great warrior who loses his best friend in the ninth year of the Trojan War, is betrayed by his commanding officer, does something shameful, and ultimately, in, in, in great shame, takes his own life. Um, the most res common response I get from when I, when I say, well, why did Sophocles write this play and stage it for his community in this century in which they saw eight years of war, is, I, I heard it from a, a Listed soldier in Germany the first time. He raised his hand and said, I think Sophocles wrote the play to boost morale. <laughs> I said, well, what's morale? About? <laughs> Watching a great man yeah, come unraveled and take his own life and fall upon the enemies. Before I could finish asking, because it's the truth. And because we're all sitting here shoulder to shoulder without it being whitewashed, acknowledging it together. And this young man's probably 18, 19 years old, but he taught me more about hmm. tragedy and theater and how it functions. I think the point that's been made about bringing theater sort of out of the traditional box and into other venues and into the community is really key for all of this. Uh, and, and it's not just for theater, but other art forms as well. And it reminded me of a, I just pulled up a quote from White where he says that democracy is a world of people talking to each other on the street as well as in institutional places. So it seems to me if that's, if that's true, then we have to be sure that we're sort of keeping up with that and make sure that we're in, we're in all those conversations and we don't ignore the fact that it's happening on the street corner, by the water cooler, everywhere else. So we're gonna pass the hat now. <laughs> oh, no, that's not part of the performance? No, no, I thought that's not, you don't do that here? You don't pass the hat? So. Anyway, thanks everybody for coming. It's good to be with you. Thank you.